The castle's fortifications are still carefully maintained by Patrick's successor, Michael, the 18th Earl. Really, at Glam's, we, we've been here as a family since its inception. And I think um, Patrick wouldn't have wanted to raise what, the castle that was here to the ground and build in those days a modern house. He wanted to keep remodeling. That was important, wasn't it, to have continuity and not to sort of have a clean sweep and build a sort of, you know, Italian style classical building, but just to really, you know, make, make the castle bigger, but it still looked like a castle. Exactly that. I mean, and he, I mean, he added the west wing, which balanced yeah. the east wing. And he did a lot in the gardens and also the, the, the front avenue or drive, as we call it now. And obviously glad with his creation, because it's a sensational portrait of him there. Mm -hmm. He's dressed in sort of skin-tight, skin-coloured Roman armour, like pointing at the newly completed extended um, castle there. It's on, 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 on the right. Well, there indeed he is with, with, with his three sons. And um, he's quite rightly very, very proud of his creation. Um, and as for the, uh, the skin-tight Roman um, <laughs> armour, I think one can only put it down to the fashion of the time. Do you know what the third old thought of Sir William Bruce and his sort of rather radical, new, classical style introduced at Kinross House? Would that have been provocative to the, for the, the third Earl? Well, I think it, in terms of different types of architecture, I mean, it's rather like chalk and cheese. I mean, Glam's is completely different from Kinross. And I mean, I'm guessing, but I suspect possibly the third Earl regarded um, Bruce's architecture is somewhat nouveau riche. To an ancient family like the Strathmores, William Bruce's power may well indeed have seemed just a little bit nouveau. A new build made with new money. But Bruce was clearly determined to strike out in a style that was new for Scotland. Not for him, old-fashioned looming towers and bristling battlements, the ornaments of the past. Instead, Bruce wanted cool, clean forms. Where once there was asymmetry, eccentricity and disorder, now there was harmony, balance and clean, crisp precision. Bruce turned his back on the castellated world of the Scottish country house and was inspired by the architecture of Renaissance Italy and by the great modern buildings he'd seen abroad. And yet for all its newness, William Bruce's house was also organised around a clear-eyed appreciation of the virtues of the old. And this, I believe, is where the real magic of Kinross lies. Sitting here on the roof, I can begin to understand the power and the meaning of Kinross House. It's organised around a straight route that starts right up there by the entrance gates, comes down the drive and then into the house. The straight route continues through the centre of the house down these steps into the garden and um, has a long way to go. The route's marked by this grassy path at the heart of the garden designed by William Bruce. The route then passes through this splendid gate in front of me, ornamented with carvings of fishes Wonderful. I go through the arch here, and the route continues onwards and onwards. I'm uh, looking at the route now, back to the house, and the route continues across the lock and terminates at the castle way over there in front of me. It's amazing. The house and the garden are all aligned on that castle. It is the focus of everything. It's 
where Mary, Queen of Scots, that most tragic of figures, was imprisoned in 1567. She was there for 11 months. Thousands of tourists make the pilgrimage to Loch Leven Castle every year. It was here that the reckless and ill-advised Mary was forced to abdicate the throne in favour of her baby son James. He was later to become James VI of Scotland and James I of England. Why was Loch Leven Castle so important for Bruce? Why did he make it the focus of his architectural vision? It was because he wanted to use his ancient architecture to imply that his family was of ancient and noble pedigree? Did he want to associate himself with Mary, Queen of Scots, who was, after all, an ancestor of the ruling monarch? We have the answer, what is clear, he was appropriating somebody else's history. The history of the castle still belonged to a far older and more important family, the previous owners of Loch Leven and Kinross, the Earls of Morton. The Mortons had lived on the estate since the 14th century. There was a Morton who held Mary, Queen of Scots, captive at the castle, not a Bruce. Charles Weems has written a PhD focusing on Kinross and William Bruce. He's also one of Bruce's few living descendants. How nice to meet you. <laughs> you must be very proud that William Bruce is an ancestor. But give me your assessment of him as an architect. I am very proud. Um, well, I think as an architect, he was, he was certainly, and he's always described as the, the introducer of classical architecture in Scotland. And I don't think there's any question that that is the case. Um, and he, at Kinross House, is magnificent. It's the most beautiful thing, creation. Um, but whether he was a very nice man is quite another matter. Whether he was a gentleman architect is how he's been described. Gentleman is not a word I'd use with Sir William Bruce. Well, what, 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 do you, what would you use? How, I mean, he, he, he's a self-made man, obviously. Tell me more about... Avaricious, you. ambitious, opportunistic. To join the nobility of Scotland, you have to own an estate. And William Bruce is one of, I know, of four other individuals who do exactly the same thing. They're new money. They've made money either as merchants or men of affairs or working for the treasury. The first thing they do with their money is to buy an estate. But they don't buy it, they buy the debts and then acquire the estate that way. What happens with Kinross is that Bruce comes along to the ninth Earl of Morton, who is in real financial distress, and he says, wait, mate, I'll, um, I'll pay off your debts if you give me the estate. And that's basically how he gets it. So it's a good example of Sir William Bruce the opportunist, I think. But Bruce had to be an opportunist if he was going to achieve his goal of Kinross. Born the second son of Lord Bruce of Blair Hall, William always knew this date and title would go to his older brother, as was the custom. From a young age, Bruce was aware he would have to make his own way in the world. Oh, here he is, William Bruce. Now, this portrait of Bruce shows him holding a drawing implement. Here it is, suggesting architectural endeavor. The portrait is dated over here, 1664, but as far as we know, he didn't design his first building until 1667. So this, in a way, is a portrait of a young man with a dream and a determination to make that dream come true. The dream of being an architect. There were many twists and turns before Bruce finally achieved his ambition. In the mid 1650s, he'd set sail from Scotland to start work as a merchant, trading wine, coal and timber on the continent. He had little experience and even less money. But he had a powerful secret weapon, charm. He knew how to make powerful contacts. 
and one of the first was a family friend, Sir Robert Murray. Murray was a member of the royal court in exile and close to Charles Stuart, the would-be king. Some of Murray's letters still survive. They belong to another descendant of Bruce, Lord Elgin, who lives outside Edinburgh at Broom Hall. So what we've got here are letters from the uh, 1650s that mention William Bruce, not from him or to him. They, 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 he, he's, he's a character in these letters, yes. isn't he? He's a young character yes. who needs discipline, <laughs> of course. <laughs> One moment they say he needs his, his lug to be pulled. <laughs> so these, these are obviously f friendly letters. Oh, yes. um, who, who, who are they from and who, who are they addressed to? In this short period of, from uh, 57 to 59, uh, Robert Murray was writing to his great friend Alexander Bruce, but Will Bruce, his name, appears at least 19 times in right. these letters. Can, I mean, can I see some of the letters and, 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 the, and the references yes. to, to Will? He's referred to well, the, in a very one, friendly one way. Thought, uh, the... Now, this letter, I see here it says, halfway through, I send you this from Will. In short, his voyage and pains have made him no gains, but diminished his stock very much. Um, so obviously, <laughs> not great success as a merchant. No, I, but they they kept trying. He was irrepressible, as it yes, were, in yes. the way he went about uh, uh, talking to people and trying to get their interest. Even though he's lazy and in, uh, there's, there's always a feeling of liveliness about it. So that's the portrait yeah. that, that, that emerges. He's a real yeah. character lurking, yeah. the third man in the letters, not none by him or to him, but, but yeah. about him. But he, he emerges as, a, as, 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 a, as an amusing character, a bit lazy, but he's trying hard. Yes. No, he's, he's an irresistible character. So, even if Bruce's business career wasn't taking off, he was now mixing in the higher circles, the royal court in exile. There had to be some way of making irresistibility pay. I'm on the quay at Leith, Edinburgh, and this was Scotland's busiest port in the late 17th century. It was from here that William Bruce sailed on a regular basis to and from the Low Countries. He was, I know, a merchant, but not a very successful one. Seems to me he must have been doing something else as well. Through his connections to Sir Robert Murray and the court in exile, Bruce was able to meet General Monk, the most powerful man in Britain. Monk was Cromwell's commander-in-chief, who secretly became the prime mover in the campaign to restore Charles Stuart to the throne. But only if Charles agreed to become a constitutional monarch, subservient to the control of Parliament. And it was Bruce who helped Monk to do this. Well, now we know that William Bruce was sailing in and out of Leith as a merchant in the 1650s. Um, but was he doing something else on these journeys, do you think? There is a suggestion that he was. Yeah. Uh, and uh, part of the evidence for that is this document here, uh, which is? is a pass or a passport mm -hmm. issued by George Monk, who's the Cromwellian governor of Scotland yeah, in this period, yeah, so a yeah, very important under figure. Under Commonwealth, yes. Uh, and it's a passport allowing Bruce to travel all over Scotland and between Scotland and Holland. To Holland, to Holland, which is where uh, it, Charles, the future Charles II is in exile at that time. That's right, amongst other places. Amongst other places yeah. So what's your feeling on Bruce's relationship with the future Charles II and indeed with the Restoration? I think that Bruce is very useful in the pre-Restoration pre, uh, period, uh, working as a mm. go-between in this sense. Uh, I think the, the, the crucial point is this document that is directly from Monk. That would suggest it's something more than just a normal merchant's yes. uh, pass. And it's, it really backs up this idea of Bruce as some kind of go-between between, between uh, the fixers uh, 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 in Holland uh, and those yes. in England and Scotland who are negotiating for the restoration. If you've been caught by parliamentary forces, Bruce could have been executed. But, risky though it was, his passport to travel in and out of Scotland freely had an unexpected benefit for Bruce. In his homeland, there had been few major buildings constructed for nearly a hundred years. But now Bruce had the chance to study the architecture of other lands. 